Cast your minds back because the year is now 2017. Nvidia had just released its 10 series lineup of graphics cards, including the GTX 1080 and the fan favorite GTX 1070. But AMD still had an ace up their sleeve to counter with. They needed to push back against Nvidia. So they released their latest, their greatest and shiniest new graphics card, their fastest ever gaming GPU. It's the Vega 64. But how well did this graphics card hold up? Is it still a feasible card for gaming in 2021? And should you buy one? This, ladies and gentlemen, is my retrospective on AMD's Vega 64. The Vega 64 usually sells for between 200 and 300 pounds, which puts it in direct competition with cards such as the GTX 1070 and RX 5600 XT. In fact, I switched from the GTX 1070 to the Vega 64 as my daily driver GPU almost two years ago. And in this video, I'll be covering whether or not I regret that decision, as well as answering once and for all if the Vega 64 deserved more credit than it actually received. So the question is, could you class the Vega 64 as the mid-range king? Well, here's the thing. Just because this graphics card would usually sell for about 200 to 300 pounds doesn't mean that it always will. In the current market, the Vega 64 has been frequently selling for well over 400 pounds. And well, you have to thank the 2021 GPU shortage for that. So for the purposes of this video, I'm going to imagine that the prices are typical market prices and ignore the current situation. Now you might think that's probably not the best thing to do, however it won't affect the benchmarks or my final recommendation as the prices have gone up across the board, as similar performing cards from Nvidia also cost the same ridiculous amount at the moment. Let's start out by looking at why this card exists. In 2017, Nvidia had complete dominance over the GPU space, and it had been years since AMD Radeon had been taken seriously by a significant chunk of the GPU market. But it was around this time that AMD's CPU division released their Ryzen CPU lineup and had begun to win back some of that mindshare Intel had been coasting off of for so many years. At this point, AMD had captured the attention of the CPU market. So could they do the same with graphics cards? Well, gamers had been long waiting for AMD to return to the high-end GPU space, as Nvidia was starting to take real advantage of their dominance with their slow but creeping price rises, as well as the fact that they had been able to take their foot off of the accelerator. A bit like what happened with Intel when they began to get complacent before Ryzen was released. So gamers were definitely keen for an AMD GPU in the high end. The issue was, could AMD provide one, even if they wanted to? Well, the answer to that is yes, but also no. The release of the Vega 64 showed that AMD could indeed challenge the raw performance of Nvidia's high-end GPU market. They certainly couldn't surpass it, but they could at least get close to matching it. The issue for AMD, however, was that doing so came at a significant cost. The Vega 64 and its little brother, and notably more popular Vega 56, came with HBM2 memory, one of what AMD hoped anyway would be its biggest selling points. HBM2, however, cost significantly more to produce than GDDR5, the memory technology used by Nvidia. So why did AMD not just want to use HBM2, but have to use it? The Vega lineup of graphics cards are powerful, but they run hot, and if you don't have a good cooler, they'll run loud as well. But it's actually HBM2 memory that saved AMD here. HBM2 actually runs at a significantly lower bandwidth per watt ratio than GDDR5. So by using HBM2, AMD were able to avoid accidentally creating a PC powered furnace, just like what we saw with Nvidia's GTX 480 all those years ago. The power consumption of the Vega 64 is already reaching over 400 watts under load. Imagine adding another 100 or so watts onto that because that's the sort of situation we would be in had AMD opted for the cheaper GDDR5 memory. So whilst it can be argued that HBM2 memory saved the Vega lineup, it also caused a lot of issues for AMD. HBM2 took up a significant chunk of the cost of these cards. The two main costs in the GPU are the die and the memory. And with the costs of the memory likely in the region of $150 to $200 per card, that's about three times as much as GDDR5, and we're already getting dangerously close to the original $400 to $500 MSRP price. 
So this was certainly a big blow for AMD's potential profits from this card. And on top of that, at the time of release, reviewers criticized AMD for their use of HBM2, citing it as useless for gamers and only useful for productivity workloads. Now, AMD was able to claw back a bit of these profits with the bundles that they released the card with. Bundling games and also giving discounts for bundling with Ryzen CPUs. But the reality is AMD really had very little choice but to take these expensive risks in an attempt to claw back some of the market share that they had lost in the years gone by. I have actually owned this Vega 64 for about two years now. I bought it as an upgrade to the GTX 1070 that I had prior, which I had returned for a refund due to some issues it was having. And in that time it served me very well. Thanks to the low demand, it can also be found for less than the GTX 1080, despite similar or sometimes better performance. The only issue is that low demand is often coupled with low availability. AMD never sold many Vega 64s, as the vast majority of people who bought Vega series cards opted for the Vega 56, which could actually be flashed with the Vega 64 BIOS, unlocking most of the performance gap between the two cards. However, being able to do this didn't help the image of the Vega series, which were already known to run hot, but with the often inferior cooling solution of the Vega 56s running at Vega 64 speeds, they were certainly known to get very hot indeed, as well as very loud. Now, I've already explained that this card is power hungry, and that means that it can come at the cost of heat. The Vega 64 can and does kick off significantly more heat than the GTX 1070 and GTX 1080 that it competed with. This means that the cooling solutions had to be big, and they had to be powerful. The model I have here is the ASUS Strix model, and this is a chunky boy. But it does keep our card cool, reaching maximum temperatures whilst gaming at 80 degrees Celsius and average temperatures of 74 degrees Celsius. Certainly not cold by any stretch of the imagination, but not the catastrophe that might have been. Speaking of gaming, the vast majority of gamers, especially at the time of the release, were using 1080p panels in their monitors. This negated a lot of the benefit that comes from HBM2, which can help the Vega 64 match the performance of the GTX 1080 at 1440p and 4K resolutions. But those are for the games of its time. In more recent titles, it doesn't hold up so well at those high resolutions. So whilst we're now on the subject of gaming, how about we take a look at some of the benchmarks for this card? I'm going to be looking at games in both 1080p and 1440p, as I feel like this card suits modern day games at 1080p very well, but with older titles you could certainly still get away with playing in those higher resolutions if you wanted to, and were happy to sacrifice a bit of that smoothness or graphics fidelity. For today's benchmarks we'll be using the following hardware. A 6 core Ryzen 3600 CPU at 3.6GHz paired with 32GB of DDR4 memory at 3200MHz. Our Vega 64 is the Asus Strix OC model, which is running on AMD's 20.11.2 driver and Windows 10 build 19042. It's worth noting that I have not done any overclocking to this card other than what came out of the box. So jumping in, our first benchmark is a canned one. It's the Unigen Superposition benchmark in which our Vega 64 scored 3925 at 1080p Extreme. There isn't much to talk about here, so let's get onto the benchmarks that you actually all care about. First up, we have Wreckfest. It's a game that I like to test on every GPU review I do. At 1080p Ultra, we have kept well above 60fps averages, scoring 75fps averages and dipping below that on occasion during crashes and other intensive scenes. Overall, the game felt very smooth and responsive. This was certainly less so at 1440p Ultra settings, where the card struggled, only achieving 45fps averages. However, when texture details were reduced, we were able to easily push over 60 FPS averages at 1440p. Star Wars Battlefront 2, again, at 1080p ultra settings, was a fantastic experience. Here we saw average FPS figures extend over 100 FPS, with the occasional drop down to the low 70s. There were one or two hitches in the game where we froze for a split second, but these were incredibly rare and had next to no impact on gaming performance. Even at 1440p, we were able to maintain FPS figures well above 60 frames per second. Out of all of the games we tested, Cyberpunk was definitely the weakest. At 1080p high settings, we weren't even able to push 60 FPS averages, achieving only 48 frames per second. On top of that, it wasn't a smooth 48 frames per second average. Instead, we often saw dips and stutters that made the experience harder to recommend. 
at 1080p low and 1080p medium, we saw significantly better results and averages stable over 60 FPS. Unfortunately, the situation only got worse at 1440p, with the expected reduction in FPS. PUBG, on the other hand, whilst not perfect, gave us frame rates that were certainly playable and made for an enjoyable and smooth experience, both at 1080p and 1440p. If you're not happy with the figures on screen, then you can go ahead and reduce down to high or even medium settings to help improve some of those lower figures in the 0.1 and 1% lows. Rocket League is a game that this GPU had no issues with whatsoever, pumping out over 200 frames per second at both 1440p and 1080p. That's despite being on maximum settings, though with motion blur disabled. Even the 0.1% lows were at or above our 60fps minimum, making this the perfect gaming experience. Next up is Grand Theft Auto V, an old game that still gets a lot of love. Almost a decade after its release and the Vega 64 has no issues here. Playing at maximum settings, we have VRAM to spare and can achieve averages above the 100fps mark at 1080p and above the 70fps mark at 1440p. We did see the FPS dip slightly during intensive scenes, but the frame rates remained acceptable at all times. Last up, we have Call of Duty Warzone. Our performance in this game with high settings was admirable, with averages above 90 FPS at 1080p and above 80 FPS at 1440p. I must admit that the odd dip in FPS here and there was noticeable, but largely the gameplay experience was smooth and made for an enjoyable gaming experience, with very little to complain about. So there we are, that is how the Vega 64 performs in 2021. The Vega 64 packs a powerful punch, but it is held back by its high heat output and significant power draw. It's definitely recommended to have a beefy power supply if you are planning on running this graphics card, as it does require two 8-pin connectors and can reach 400 watts of power consumption under heavy loads. So the question is, should you buy this graphics card? Well, I did and I'm happy with it. Sure, it's not the most efficient card I've ever bought, but it is certainly packed with power and can competently play all the games I need it to. You may find it easier to source an alternative Nvidia card, however if you're happy to wait a bit and do a bit more hunting, you could find yourself a bargain with the Vega 64, potentially producing more FPS at a cheaper price than its Nvidia counterparts. And that about wraps up the video. If you did enjoy it or found it useful, then be sure to leave me a like. And if you've got a Vega 64 or plan on getting one, leave a comment down below letting me know what you think of it and what games you're planning on playing. Thanks for watching the video guys and I will see you in the next one.